A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, I'm Victoria Meyer, host of The Chemical Show podcast. This week, I have James Drake, who is a patent attorney with over 25 years of experience at Fortune 50 and global companies in the chemical industry. James has guided um, firms in diverse markets from telecommunications to petrochemicals to retail in identifying, protecting, and monetizing their innovations and inventions. Um, He is now managing counsel of Drake and Associates, um, where he provides a full suite of intellectual property services to companies um, in chemicals and out of chemicals. So James, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thank you for having me, Victoria. I appreciate it. Hey, delighted to have you here. So, so James, you and I go back a bit, and, and I've, I've sat across the negotiating table with you on intellectual property-related items, but you know, let's go back to the beginning maybe a little bit. How did you get started working in IP? Yeah, it's definitely a long time ago. So when, when, uh, when I was doing undergrad, I was actually looking toward uh, possibly a career in a medical field, and um, my undergraduate degree is in biology. And through, through a series of circumstances, I ended up deciding that wasn't for me. Mostly it was physiology lab that, that determined that. I didn't really care for that. And so uh, I, I decided, looked around at what other op- options were available. And I said, well, maybe I'll look at law school. And I did that. And, and I started in law school. And, and literally, uh, there was a posting on a job board, which obviously dates me, but they were looking for somebody with an undergrad science degree, which I had, and they were looking for somebody in BP America's patent and licensing uh, department at the time. And it was absolutely the worst first interview you could possibly have to this day. I do not know how I got the job because I walked in and the first gentleman I spoke to said, so have you ever seen a patent before? And I said, no. And he pulled one out and, and on the spot went through all the parts of it with me and, and explained what it all was. And by the time that 10 minutes was over, I said, oh, my gosh, I can act. This is something I can do for a career. And I was wow. that's and, pretty amazing. That's, that's what got me into it. Yeah, it, it was really uh, one of those chance things. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So so when we talk IP or intellectual property, it's not always well understood by business leaders. I mean, right. Um, you know, people throw these words around, <laughs> patent attorneys like you throw these words around, um, and we don't really understand it. So, and I do think people are familiar with the concept of patents and trademarks, but it's broader than that. So right. explain more about what this is and what, what business leaders need to know about IP. Right. And, and all of those things in intellectual property fall into a category that we like to call uh, intangible property. So you can't touch it. You can't you, you know, feel it. And, and that always makes it hard to grasp what it is necessarily. But intellectual property is basically uh, things that you've generated with your, your ideas internally in your mind and, and then used in order to gain some sort of an advantage in the marketplace, um, whether it's uh, with an innovation that nobody else has and you can prevent that, your competitors from using it. Uh, it could be a slogan or a new name, and that would fall into a trademark area. Uh, or, or you could simply publish a paper that, uh, you know, everybody else refers to, and then you've got copyright protections. So there, there are all so, sorts of uh, intellectual property segments, if you will. And the, the key there is to figure out ahead of time what your business goal is, because intellectual property strategy should track very closely to your business strategy. Once you know what you're trying to do from a business standpoint, then you can adjust your intellectual property strategy accordingly. I'll give you an example. So let's say that you've just broken into a new market 
and you want to be you know, fairly aggressive about gaining market share and things like that. Well, you might want to invest a lot in your R&D and you might want to build up a portfolio of patents based on that R&D and those new innovations. Right. Um, what happens then is over time, that portfolio matures. Um, either you stop making new innovations or you've gotten to a point where you, you, you're happy with your market share and everything. Now, now your strategy shifts a little bit. Now you're not looking so much to, to gain, but to maintain and to defend your position. And so then you may look at using different types of patents uh, in order to, using your patents in a different way, let's say, in order to create a uh, competitive barrier. And mm -hmm. as, you're, as you mature even further, there are ongoing costs with your patent portfolio. So you need to be constantly looking at that and saying, okay, what's my business strategy right now? And then do the patents, do the trademarks, all the intellectual property I have, do they support that strategy? And if they don't, maybe push them aside or, or do something else with them. Um, huh. But if they do, maintain them. Do, so do companies really do this though? I mean, or, and, and maybe, you know, are there examples if you could share of companies sure. that do this well, that they actually actively manage their um, IP portfolio in alignment with their business strategy? Yeah, I, I, one I, I can tell you that I've been partic I've participated in was uh, when I was with the Dow Chemical Company. Um, they have what they call intellectual asset management teams, and they review their portfolios on a regular basis. And it's it's patents, it's trademarks, it's agreements, and mm -hmm. they look at it. Oftentimes, they'll look at those on a quarterly basis and and have a, a meeting and determine what do we want to do going forward. Is this aligned with what we're still doing? from a business standpoint, uh, and, and what do we want to keep and what do we want to get rid of? And getting rid of doesn't necessarily mean abandoning something. And this is where you can start to look at uh, using your portfolio for, say, alternative revenue streams. So perhaps you're not going to be as active in a certain area as you had been previously. You may want to sell or license your portfolio to a different company, smaller company, or, or somebody else who wants to focus in that area. And, and then you can get a revenue stream that way. Or, or they may have intellectual property. They may have patents uh, that you are concerned that you might infringe. You can cross license between the two. And in that way, you gain access to intellectual property, but your competitors don't. Yeah. So, that seems pretty sophisticated, right? Yeah. So, so it doesn't surprise me that Dow is, um, has a, a very robust approach to this. It seems to me that a lot of companies probably don't. What's the bare minimum that companies need? If they're, if they're not sure about what that is, where, where do you start even on this journey? Well, the bare minimum is just to know what it is you have. And, and that sounds axiomatic. It sounds like, well, yeah, of course you do. But a lot of people don't know what they have. Patents have a 20-year term, and oftentimes these things can get uh, lost over time. So, so doing a, uh, a good census, if you will, of what your intellectual property is and understanding what exactly you have is probably the thing that you want to start with. Um, I will tell you that a lot of companies get very serious about this when they start to have to pay uh, maintenance fees and annuities on older patents. The, the story doesn't end when you get a patent issued. There's ongoing costs. And I was with a company, uh, it's no longer, in, in, it's been bought out, but in the early 1990s, uh, they went from $400,000 a year in maintenance fees to slightly over a million in just a year because wow. they had created a lot of innovation and they patented a lot of it but nobody was paying attention to when they were coming, you know, due. Ah, interesting. So, uh, so it's a good thing, but you also have to maintain it. It sounds like. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of innovation in the chemical industry. So yeah. it seems that um, IP activity would be high. Certainly when we think about patenting of innovations and, you know, it, my guess is uh, if we were to look at kind of, IP activity, a lot of it's probably around sustainability and green and circularity, et cetera. Sure. And yet sometimes there's also a little bit of mystique and concern about when you patent, you have to disclose right. um, and you're letting your secrets out. Right. 
So, I mean, that's, that's literally the deal. Uh, it, it, you know, patent law is, is enshrined in the Constitution. We, we start right off by saying we, we want to advance progress of the useful arts. And uh, the patent, office, patent and trademark office is, is one of the ways that we do that. Um, the, the reason that people get a little bit hesitant uh, when they start developing new innovations is they don't want to reveal everything. But the deal is the patent and trademark office gives you a 20 year limited monopoly. And in exchange, you tell everybody how to do what it is so that you can continue to build as, as a society. Um, I, I think one of the things that that touches on too is, is what I call patent urban myths. And mm. one of the things that I, I see a lot of, uh, and this is from C-suite on down, is this idea that I need to get a patent because I want to do X. And what a lot of people don't understand, it's not intuitive, a patent doesn't give you a right to do anything. A patent gives you a right to exclude others from doing ah. something. And, and it's, a, it's a distinction, but it, it means a lot because there may be other things that are patented out there that even if you've got a patent on what you're doing, you would infringe somebody else's patent if you, if you do what you're doing. Mm. So it, it's having that understanding that, you know, just going out and getting a patent is not enough. You really need to understand what the landscape is. You need to understand what your competitors are doing uh, and, and then determine how you want to approach it. Now, so is, is keeping trade secrets a viable approach? Keeping trade secrets is a viable approach. The problem is most people don't do it very well. Uh, and and this is this yeah. is across the this is across industry because you know th there are some basic requirements in order to maintain a trade secret and trade secrets are great trade secrets never expire you don't have to register a trade secret but what you have to do is you have to keep it secret from everybody else and it's it's sort of the old maxim that uh, if you tell somebody it's no longer a secret right so you, you really have to have strong controls on, on how you store information related to your trade secrets. If it's a process, if it's a product, whatever it may be, you probably want to have your own dedicated server that has all that information. And um, you, you want to make sure that the, the access to that information is limited. And this starts to tie into other functions in, mm. in the company too, because you want to be able to have HR uh, understand what things this person, who, if they're leaving the company, what trade secrets they've had access to and explain to them what their ongoing obligations are with those. So, yeah, which then uh, opens up more exposure about that trade secret. So, right. so, so that's a good point because I think, um, you know, know how falls in to some yep. of this intellectual property. And yet we see maybe even an accelerating movement of people between companies, right? Absolutely. So um, it's hard to lobotomize your new employee so that they can't use the old person, the old company's information. So um, it seems like a pretty gray area at times. Definitely. I mean, absent somebody uh, coming in with a, a thumb drive and, and downloading your entire database, uh, oftentimes, it's just information that they bring with them. And you're right, it's hard to segregate general information that they've learned versus specific information uh, from, the, from the company where they've been. But again, this gets back to my, my point about companies not necessarily doing it correctly. Mm. You, need to be, you need to track what your trade secrets are. And it can't be everything. This is, this is another one of the things where um, oftentimes I'll get uh, emails from clients and, and they'll say attorney client privilege, but they'll put it on everything. If you put it on everything, it, it, they're not going to honor that. So you need Got to it. really understand what trade secrets are very important and are giving you a competitive advantage and then uh, protect them accordingly, keep track of them, let, let their employees know what, what is a trade secret and what is not. And once you've been able to, to put that kind of a process together, uh, it gets much easier. Got it. So a lot of this sounds like um, managing this whole IP portfolio is a lot about having systems and processes in place. Absolutely. Yeah. And because what you're going to do if you, if you end up in a situation where you're going to court and you're you know, suing your competitor and or your former employee 
for uh, trade secret, um, you know, for taking your trade secrets, you're going to have to show that you took the necessary steps uh, for protecting those trade secrets in line with what you thought the value of those trade secrets was. Now that's, that's a moving target. So it's always hard to say if you're going to meet that standard, but if it's the most important thing in your company, uh, you, you look at the formula for Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, they've got the formula. I think there's only three individuals within Coca-Cola who can access the, tra- the uh, safe deposit box that they have. And it moves from branch to branch in this one bank in Atlanta and they can't fly at the same time. There's all sorts of rules. So that is, so that is not an urban myth. That is truly a trade. No, it's absolutely true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, okay. So let's turn the conversation a little bit. I know that you, you've you said that recently you've started focusing quite a bit on data privacy and data privacy compliance. So mm-hmm. what led you to that space and, and then even what's critical in this area? Right. So this ties in with, uh, with intellectual property probably more than I expected it to. Uh, so I, I was, you know, practicing in the intellectual property space and, and licensing and things like that. And uh, I, I started to get more and more inquiries about GDPR, which is the was European data privacy law, and then more recently CCPA, which is California privacy law. And, and what I started to understand was that information that companies keep about their customers or that they've brought in from their customers uh, is, is an asset in and of itself. And, hmm. and you could argue that data privacy might be a new form of intellectual property that's, that's coming uh, online. And so I started seeing more and more posts about uh, data privacy law. And what I also saw was that nobody was quite sure what, what data privacy laws applied and uh, what they needed to do about them. And yeah. as you read through the laws, you can understand because they're not they're not really written with the final user in mind. They just sort mm. of threw some things at the wall. And, and so what we're finding is that a lot of companies are, are doing one of two things. Either they're, they're saying, well, I've, I've, got this, uh, I've got this service that I use and, and I figure they're taking care of it. Or they're saying, eh, yeah, they'll go after Facebook, they'll go after Google, but they won't go after me. Well, what I like to tell them is it's kind of like the IRS. They'll, they'll work their way down to you eventually. And, and given that the, the data privacy, you know, the penalties for violating various data privacy laws can be quite severe. You're talking anywhere from two to 4% uh, of uh, global revenue if you violate uh, GDPR in Europe. And mm. people go, well, I'm not in Europe. Doesn't matter. If you're processing data from European residents, you may be subject to GDPR. Got it. Similar sort of thing with, with California, where if you, you've got a certain number of your um, customers who are in California, then CCPA will apply to you. And, and it's happening all across the country. Virginia just passed a law. Massachusetts has a, has a law. New York's working on one. They, they keep trying to put one through at the federal level, but so far... Uh, nothing's happened. So you have to keep track of this patchwork. Got it. So it's interesting. So one of the things you talked about is, you know, when you collect your customer's information, that's an asset. And Mm -hmm. and it makes me immediately think about, you know, mailing lists, right? We've all ended up on mailing lists or phone lists, and they seem to get sold, transferred, et cetera. Uh, You know, it's, is it still a viable thing for that? I mean, obviously we're still getting, uh, you know, I still get spam. Yeah, yeah. Of some of which is more or less valuable than others. Um, how do how do companies manage that and, and right. even ma- manage the patchwork of it? Because there is value there. Yeah, and and the key there is is really transparency. That's what all these laws are are directed toward doing. And so, what you want to make sure you do is you're you're informing your customers when you take in information, and mm-hmm. that you're getting their consent for what exactly it is you want to do with that information. Um, and you'll see this oftentimes on uh, websites, especially yeah. probably in the last year or so, you see things pop up all the time. We use information to do this, 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 and this. And, you know, please click accept. Um, yeah. Well, so I got to be honest. I So when it comes to like cookies, yep. I am um, 
pretty tough on the cookies. So I always, you know what? I've always looked to see what cookies they're tracking. Not yep. always, many times. And we'll only let them track the minimum because they don't need to be doing all the rest. You're of the time. exception right. though. I know I'm the exception. Well, yeah. because here's the thing. And this, to me, this is the challenging space in data privacy is you're often forced to just check, accept, right? I can't redline a document. Right. Uh, I just have to check it because I want to purchase something or get access to a certain piece of information um, or whatever it is. So it's, uh, yeah, maybe they're informing me and it's buried in there, but can so I actually is, do anything about it? Right. So that, and that, that's an issue that a lot of these laws looked at when they were being written. Um, it's kind of like the click through uh, licenses that you used to have uh, right. when you when you'd have physical software, um, it's the same kind of idea. So what they've done is that a lot of these laws have a means by which um, you can file what's called a data subject request. So you basically, they, there's a requirement that each business has some sort of method for you to contact them and say, hey, I don't know what information you have about me. So first of all, I need to know what information do you have about me? And, and there are prescribed time limits in which they have to provide that information and so forth. And then you also have a right of correction and a right of removal. Um, in, in Europe, uh, they, they call this the right to be forgotten. So after a certain amount of time, you know, your information should be removed anyway. But this is a mechanism that uh, exists. And the problem is that a lot of companies, when they're talking about data privacy, focus on breaches. You know, they, you see right. this all the time. There's a breach right. and hundreds of thousands of inf- names and so, which, which is good. They should focus on breaches. However, they also have an obligation under a lot of these laws to be, you know, for their customers to be able to contact them and say, I, you know, you, you had my information. I got the services or goods that I needed. I don't want you to have my information anymore. Hmm. Interesting. So it seems like this is something that big companies, you know, are obviously doing, but maybe small companies are less equipped to do, right? Yeah, I mean, this exactly. is something that, and I think about in across the chemical space and particularly there's, yeah, we've got a lot of, of very big companies and mid-sized companies. And then there's a wealth of smaller, perhaps more entrepreneurial companies that are operating on a much leaner basis that maybe think that this doesn't apply or they don't even know how to apply it. Right. And um, actually, uh, I'll give a quick uh, plug. I'm working on a uh, uh, venture uh, with a a colleague of mine who has his own IT security business in uh, Colorado. And we're, we're just about to launch Drake on consulting. Uh, So so watch, watch this space. We will. That's, that's exactly the idea behind that. It's the idea that small companies don't really have the resources to to have a dedicated function for that. Right. Even even medium sized companies oftentimes will have a, a legal function and they'll have an IT function, but they don't have a, a, an overall you know direction that they need to follow in order to be able to comply with these data privacy laws. And what 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 my my partner Jason and I have have come to the conclusion of is. Legal people and IT people don't tend to talk to one another very much. And and to the extent they do, they sometimes kind of speak different languages. Absolutely. And and so we're what we're trying to offer is something that will be uh, a, a compliance, a data privacy compliance service uh, that is not within the company itself, but that can handle everything soup to nuts for that company, small, medium-sized businesses. Right. Um, so that's that's what we're looking to do. And uh, I, I think to your point, you know, a lot of these companies don't want to think about this because it requires adding on a lot of personnel and things like that. Yeah. Or maybe just don't know how to think about it. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because they, they understand that there's this thing called data privacy out there. They're, they're trying super hard to make sure that they don't have any breaches, but that's about it. They, yeah. they, they don't really know what the requirements are. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, I think business leaders, the the leaders I talk to at companies, big and small, they're, you know, their goal is to run a business, make money, to generate yeah. profits, and they want to do it in a compliant way. 
<laughs> right. But they have no idea what that whole area of compliance means, whether it's intellectual property or data or any of the other multitudes of uh, compliance requirements. And I think that's yeah, bribery a and, and corruption right. laws, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it even ties in, it'll, it'll even tie in sometimes with respect to, um, you know, some of our uh, boycott, uh, in from, you know, things like uh, you, you can't send certain things to certain countries. Um, ah, and and that's, that's even parsed out by what kind of a product it is. And sometimes it, it rarely is it actually an entire country. People get this wrong all oh. the time. It's usually individuals within the country. And it's usually the, 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 the individuals who are the right people that it effectively bars the whole country. But yeah. Even then, there are exceptions. We, um, I, I've done filings of patent applications in Iran, and you're allowed to pay Iranian uh, associates to continue prosecution of your patent application. It's one of the exceptions. Interesting. Well, and in fact, I, um, you know, even on something like LinkedIn, I've gotten a couple of requests recently from company from countries that I think are on like the no-fly list. You know, if I so to speak, sure. like do not come. And I'm like. Eh. Yeah. I don't think I should even accept this. I don't know who this person is um, or, or what the, the connection is. And I, and I think they're in a country I shouldn't be doing business with anyway. So let me just right. bypass it and move on. Yeah, it's, it starts, I've, I've seen things that, despite the fact that there was that exception in place, uh, I've, I've had interactions with associates, for example, who will say, uh, you know, whatever you do, I'm going to send you this invoice but do not send, send it to this other bank in this other oh, country. God. And whatever you do, don't put the word Tehran on it. And that immediately raises red flags, obviously. Right. And then you, okay. Right. Well, how about I just so, don't do business that way yeah, and then we that, don't have to worry about it. That's yeah. probably the easier way. And it's, it's a similar kind of thing when, when you're talking about anti-bribery laws, where uh, a lot of times people will, will hire agents in a country and those, and, and and then sort of say, well, see no evil, hear no evil. Uh, I don't know what those agents do. That's actually not a defense. And if they go out there, they start bribing people. You're going to be liable for that. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. This is um, this has been really interesting, James. So um, so in addition to doing all this work on IP and data privacy and finding a new entrepreneurial venture to yeah. to start up. You know, what else are you doing in your free time? Do you have free time or what are you looking to do now that it appears at least the U.S. is loosening up restrictions yeah. and stuff? Well, I, I'm looking to travel more. I, I really think, especially with the this uh, sort of uh, uh, burgeoning data privacy compliance business, it's one of those things where you definitely have to be uh, at the customer location and, and understanding yeah. how data is being used within that location and where it goes and, and where it comes back. So um, I'm definitely looking looking forward to doing more traveling and, uh, and getting to see people face to face. Zoom is is a great option, but uh, it, there's nothing like having that body language and everything right in front of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think most everybody I talk to is ready to start traveling again. Uh, well, that should so be good. We'll I saw I saw Boeing just bought a whole bunch of supersonic jets. So we'll see. We'll see how quickly they can fill those. I hope so. And, you know, the uh, a, a strong uh, aerospace and airline industry is ultimately good for the chemical industry because yeah, the absolutely. products factor into it. So we, we all need some more travel. So. Good. Yep. James, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Thank if you. people want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? They can find me at the uh, world's worst URL. It's Drake and Associates LLC. And the word and is written out. So that, that's, that's my website. And please feel free to reach out and contact me or through LinkedIn at, at James Drake. Okay. Awesome. James, thanks so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you today. Likewise, Victoria. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.